So hello, welcome to the security dev room. Uh, get a seat and we'll start by introducing Kai from Germany who is going to talk about Panopticon, uh, IDA disassembler. Welcome. Oh. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Kai from Bochum, I'm a hacker. And um, I'm today here to tell you about an open source project called Panopticon, which is a cross-platform Libre disassembler. Um, so I will first talk a bit about the goals of the project, and then we will come back to reality and see how the project actually um, is implemented now. And um, if the time isn't up there yet, I will tell a bit about the uh, architecture. Um, but first, I want to make the case for why we need such a tool. And um, well, when we're in security, especially we um, need disassembler for analyzing proprietary software, for example, finding bugs in um, tools like oh, Windows and um, analyze malware because most of the malware doesn't come with source code attached. Um, and often um, when we are just free software developers, we often want to um, implement free software replacement for file systems or network protocols that are implemented in proprietary tools only. So we have to um, rip those tools apart too. Um, that's what we need a disassembler tool, and um, most of the tools we use now, especially in security work, um, are all proprietary. Um, so the idea about uh, the project, project is to build a replacement um, for these proprietary tools. And um, so when I'm talking about reverse engineering, I'm talking about binary reverse engineering, so we're only concerned about um, ELF binaries or PE binaries that um, are implemented in machine code. And, um, what I'm also not talking about is automatic reverse engineering. So what we are doing here is mostly about manual reverse engineering. Um, so Panopticon has this kitchen sink approach where you have one tool that does everything and um, everything is integrated and at your fingertips. And you have an integrated uh, graphic user interface um, to allow you to surf the code and figure out what the application does. Um, so this assembly always starts with the disassembly. And, um, this is where most of the open source tools stop. So we have our binary code. Um, we can reverse the last assembly, the last step of the compilation of the assembly, um, because it's more or less a one-to-one -one mapping between bits and um, the assembly code listing. And um, for example, tools like Object Dump just dump the assembly code uh, onto the console and lets you read it. Um, but that's not something you can really use in, in reality, because most of these tools have millions of lines of assembly listing, and we are not interested in 99% of the code. Because if you know a bit about programming, we already know how it's implemented. What we're interested in, in is it this little part in the application that implements the state machine for the network protocol, or that checks the file system, um, or that implements some kind of backdoor. So what the advanced tools do, it's what's called static analysis. So it takes that assembly code listing, and tries to cut it up into chunks. So the concept of functions, for example, exists, exists on the assembly level. So we can um, separate the code into functions, and then separate the functions in something called basic blocks, which are um, sequences of assembly code instructions that are executed without interruption. So we know when the first instruction uh, is executed. Execution will continue until the end of the basic block, and then we have a jump or a branch. So our tools. Um, try to recover this information, build a nice graph, and then comes the last part, which is often overlooked, especially by um, open source tools. And I think this, this problem is mostly cultural. Um, we have to get the information that's in the computer into the brain of the user. Um, so we have, we need a graphic user interface. So the interface part is the important one. Uh, we, what we essentially have to do is to transform the information in the computer in a way that our brains can um, well understand it. Um, so with Panopticon, we take a step um, that's not often done by most open source tools, is that the graphic user interface is an integral part of the system. So when you implement a feature, or what you want me to implement a feature, you have to tell me not only how it interacts with the disassembler part and the static analysis part, but also how do we represent the information we gather to the user in a way the user can actually use. So not just dumping into a text file or something like that, but um, ten, turning into pictures or something like that, that we can actually um, they will help the user to understand the binary. So that's really important. Um, another thing most of the even proprietary tools lack is analysis based, based on semantics. So um, what most tools do is they know how assembly code looks like. So they know this bit pattern turns into this mnemonic, and the mnemonic is a string. And we know how the arguments look like, and the arguments are also, also strings. And um, that's pretty much it. It just gives you the dead code to, for you to read. Um, 
But what's more interesting is when we have a tool that actually understands the semantics of the code at runtime. Um, so what Panopticon does, it, it implements an intermediate language, so a bit like you use in compilers. Um, that are, so for every mnemonic, we um, recognize we also generate a, a short sequence of intermediate language that's e easy to analyze um, that implements the semantics of this opcode at runtime. Um, and when we have the semantics, we can do analysis on the semantics instead of just at the syntax of what it looks like. And um, I will give you two examples of what we could do when we have the semantics. And um, the first one is called abstract interpretation. Um, the basic idea here is um, that we have an analysis um, across all possible paths throughout the program. And instead of just looking at one path and a one value at a time, um, we just replace concrete values with sets of values or abstractions of set of values. So um, what I mean with that um, is here a bit explained. So we have the C code on the left, and that implements a switch statement. It's just a bunch of cases. And um, when you have a certain set of cases for value, we uh, print prime. And um, if it isn't, of course, this is all primes. And um, if there isn't a case, so we uh, return false. And uh, what GCC does from this code is it implements something resembling a binary search tree. Um, so if you first uh, start with the middle case, which is 11, I think, and um, we'll look if value is equal to 11. And if it's equal, of course, it jumps to the basic block that implements the print. And if it doesn't, it compares whenever um, a value is larger or smaller than 11 and then branches um, according to that. And so you have some kind of tree that um, unfolds towards the bottom. And at the bottom, you have the false case where everything flows together. So what we often are interested in is, OK, what are the values um, that causes the printf to fire? And um, of course, when we are an experienced reverse engineer, we can always see that this is um, a binary search tree, and this is probably a switch case statement. So we read the code and um, check for all the equal um, for the comparisons and the equal jumps. And then we see that all the equal jumps uh, flow into one basic, blocks, basic block. Um, what abstract interpretation can do is automate ex exactly that. So it can execute the code, um, figure out, OK, um, when this jump uh, is taken, uh, value must be 11. And if this jump is taken, value must be 19. And it can take the superset of all the possible values and show us that. There are limits to that, of course. Um, doing abstract interpretation, of course, for, uh, across the whole world program is hard, especially when you have things like I.O. Um, but again, you can do this manually. But um, having a machine to do it for you and presenting it to you um, helps you to concentrate on the big picture and do that what the machine can analyze, which is um, inferring what this means, so what it means when a value is 11, for example. Um, so just giving hints to the user um, will, I believe, uh, make a reverse engineering way more easier. Um, another thing is called bounded model checking. Um, as opposed to abstract interpretation, we are in, with bound model checking, we only care about one specific path throughout the program um, that is feasible um, under a set of constraints. Um, so one uh, example where we could use this is, OK, this code is a bit artificial, but um, it implements some kind of sanity check on a network protocol or a, or a file system um, format. So um, we, first, we have two inputs, A and B, that's just answer integers. And uh, we first check that A is smaller than B. And then A mustn't be 0. And then we multiply A by 3 and invert B. And then we add them both together. And we expect this to be hexadecimal um, 42. So when we are um, combining this, we get something um, that looks like we have on the right. Um, so we have all the checks. And um, the true branches are the fall through here. So we want to follow the red uh, lines. And um, the last basic block is the one uh, we're interested in that, of, again, prints the OK. So of course, we're interested. So what does the input have to look like in order um, to that print have been executed? And um, of course, what, what we do with, as experienced reverse engineers is we execute the code backwards in our mind. We, call, we, we check the first condition. So OK, the addition has to be uh, OX42. Uh, and um, then we trace the code backwards. And um, what we do in reality is we write a, a short Python a program that just enumerates our cases until we find one. Um, so at least that's what I do. Um, what binary uh, what model can do is generate an, um, well, um, more or less a formula from that. We add a bunch of constraints, and then we throw it into the magic binary model checking algorithm, and it will, it will give us a possible trace throughout the program that will um, hit that basic block. So what we do here is um, we add the constraint that that last jump is taken, which just means um, that the zero flag has to be one. 
And um, then the model checking algorithm will look for a possible set of values that will fulfill this constraint and give us the values and including the traces uh, up there. So we see uh, on the top there, we need A to be OX15114 AA6 and um, B is something else. And um, what's uh, very nice about this is that you can add additional constraints. So maybe you can, you can see A, but maybe there are um, some checks before that. Um, you already saw um, that uh, check that A isn't this value, so you can add another constraint that, okay, we want that uh, job to be taken, but as we don't want that A uh, to be that value, and we can uh, start the algorithm again, and it will find another solution or will tell us that there is no solution, or it will comp try to compute forever, and, um, and it will crash. But these are the three possibilities. So just um, as a reminder, the difference between abstract interpretation and bound watching is with abstract interpretation, we are looking at all paths um, at the same time. And with bound watching, we're just taking it, looking at one path. So um, aside from that, some other features I would like to see and um, sending all of outrageous with. Um, what would be really, really nice, so Panopticon is meant as a static analysis tool, but um, having dynamic information is always very helpful when you have huge applications. So of course, with the semantic information, you could simulate the whole program, but um, this is very expensive, and especially with bound model checking, you can't do this on real life applications. So it's pretty much impossible to do bound model checking on a wall chromium instance, for example. Um, so having the ability to include traces from PIN, for example, um, dynamic RIO or, the, or just the GDB instance would be really helpful. And what I would like to see is that we um, can match the traces onto the control flow graphs and that can tell us, okay, when you have this input under this environment, um, control flow flows like that. And when I change that value or that part of the environment, control flow flows like that. So that would be really helpful, I think. And uh, the nice thing is we already have traces. We have already have PIN. We have dynamic RIO. We just have to implement um, the matching and uh, the reading of these traces. Um, of course, you always need scripting support. Um, when you have a powerful tool, you want to automate things. So um, embedding at any type of scripting language would really be helpful. I would prefer to have only one. And um, I would like. I, I don't want to uh, start in the, a, any language war, so, um, but we can do pretty much everything Ruby, Python, Rails. Um, I'm not a fan of Lisp, so in, if in case you want Guile, um, that may be a longer discussion, but um, I can live with everything. And uh, well, when you want to replace IDA Pro, you have to replace hex rays, so a decompiler would be pretty nice. Um, even a decompiler doesn't uh, really decompile, so the, the C code you get out there isn't really C code that was written, especially when the program wasn't written in C. And, um, but only, only, only get that code. So there, this, this kind of bound world checking um, can, can be done on C, but um, there's no real use in doing it in C instead of in the assembly code. Um, but the control flow structures you have in C are easier to read. Your control flow graph is always planar. Um, you have high level type information. It makes it easier to read real life applications. So having some kind of decompiler would be nice. This isn't as impossible as it looks like, especially if, when you have semantic informations. You can use abstract interpretations, for example, to recover stack layouts and uh, the use of stack frames throughout the program. And then you only have to do a type inference algorithm. So back to reality. Um, this is all nice, and part of this is implemented, especially the abstract interpretation part. Um, but aside from that, the program uh, isn't as far, uh, far as I wanted to. So how does it look like? A bit like that. So um, we have a graphic user interface. It's in Qt. And you can open the application. You can open the file. And um, then we we'll start disassembly at the entry point, and we give you a list of functions. You can click the list of functions. You get a control flow graph. You can pan around, can zoom, um, can click on one of the lines, add comments, save the whole thing. That's pretty much it. Um, we can disassemble Intel architectures, um, as well as two of the smaller 8-bit microcontrollers. We have semantic informations for the 8-bit microcontrollers, pretty much complete. And um, well, Intel is another thing. We have more than 500 memotics in Intel, and so you have to write the semantic information for 500 uh, or so opcodes. Um, but this isn't as bleak as it looks like, because when you look at real-life applications, when you implement m around 100, 120 of the most popular opcodes, you already have 99% of everything that's in there. And um, 
as I said before, we are not really concerned about global program analysis. We just want a local reasoning about that function or that set of basic blocks. So um, what happens at runtime? How do I get to, to the path there? So it isn't as important that we have 100% um, that we are 100% uh, precise. We're not trying to do this, um, symbolic execution or do automatic exploit generation. Um, we can open ELF files. I actually have a pull request open pretty much now. I will merge when I come home and get a bit of sleep. Um, so we will un, um, support PE files too. And um, aside from that, we can roll the raw flash for AVR, which isn't that complicated. Um, also, the project is hosted on GitHub. Um, we have an open development model. We use the issue tracker there. So in case you have a question, um, you can open an issue. Um, I will try to answer it. And um, if you have a patch, you can send it as a pull request. So I have a bit of time left, so I will talk a bit about the architecture. Um, the application is in one repository, but it's two parts. So we have one library that does all the disassembly, the static analysis, and the representation of the um, code. And it's written in Rust. Um, in case you never used Rust, um, it's not that much different from C++, for example. Um, so I started Rust one and a half years ago, and um, it took me three months or so um, to understand it in a way that I can program tools like that. So it isn't that, complica that complicated. We also have uh, the graphical front end, which is a bit Rust to interact with the library. And um, on top of that is QML. That's some kind of JavaScript derivative that's used by Qt to implement uh, widgets. Mm. So when you clone the repository, you see something like that. Um, the library consists of around 20 um, files that are more or less named after the um, thing they do. Um, we have the abstract interpret, which is the abstract interpreter. And um, then we have the assemblers for AMD64, AVR, and MOS. And um, then we have some kind of tree of the uh, representation of the program. So um, at the lowest level, we have the mnemonics, which is mnemonic RS. Um, mnemonics are grouped into basic blocks. Basic blocks are grouped into functions. Functions are grouped into programs. And programs are grouped into a project. And the project is sort of the top level node of what's saved in the application. And um, well, you have the, um, the data definitions in there. You also have ILRS, which is the um, definition of the intermediate language we use there. Um, in case you're more on the academic side, we use Rail. Um, but it's, um, it's a derivative for Rail, and um, we have some custom functions, um, custom um, operations in there. And um, well, the front end isn't that uh, complicated. We have a bunch of uh, Rust files to um, communicate with the library and do the layouting for the control for graphs. And then aside from that, we have a folder called QML, where all the QML files live. Each uh, file implements one widget. That isn't that complicated. So in case you never use JavaScript, um, it isn't that far. It isn't that uh, JavaScripty as you would expect. Um, also, Qt has a really nice documentation, so you can check that out. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. So, in case you're interested and may want to help me and uh, or just want to check out the project, um, we have a website. We you can also uh, we have on the website there the link to the API documentation, the users documentation. And um, we are, you can also jump to the GitHub repository directly. And um, also, if you have a question, you can um, reach us on the uh, Freenode channel. And also, we have a Twitter account where we mostly post about news about the project. So that's it. Thank you, Kai. So we have five minutes for questions. Uh, we have the first one here. Uh, wondering why Rust? I mean, I love Rust, but yeah. I'm wondering why. why. Um, the project started years ago, and I used C++, because why not? And um, I'm sick of C++. And um, when, I, when I saw Rust, Rust solves the problems I have with real life C++ applications. And um, this is my hobby project. So um, I just thought to myself, why not use Rust? Um, so one year ago, I just rewrote the application that was at that time 10,000 lines of code into Rust. And um, turns out it was way easier than I thought. Um, I actually uh, got the line count down to 8,000. I have less bugs. And um, Rust really helps me to avoid the kind of bugs you have with C++ um, code bases, like 
iterator and validation data races. Um, it's way less painful to program Rust than C++. Um, I was wondering about um, obfuscated malware, and in particular, there are some TTPs that you can recognize so easily that you could potentially build semantic information for that. Yes. Um, of course, obfuscation is there to stop us. Um, there's only so much you can do. Um, you know, that, that's why it's interesting to have uh, dynamic information. So when you have something that unpacks itself at runtime, you can uh, do a snapshot and import it. Um, also when you have um, things like virtualized uh, malware, where you have some, some uh, interpreter in there, what you can do is use the scripting engine to implement some kind of lifter for that intermediate language after you have disassembled it. And um, then use, because you only have to, ex to, to generate the intermediate language, and then use all the um, code analysis features that are built in there to do the code analysis directly on the obfuscated in, uh, f um, virtualized malware. But of course, this is a problem. It's there to stop us. We can all do so much. Uh, follow one question on that. Do you have the disassembler for other languages? You had C, but we're thinking to disassemblers to C++ or some other high-level language. Or well, are you, you planning it? You can decompile to C++ too, right? Um, also, with C++, you have the um, advantage that you can uh, try to pattern match certain parts of the C++ compiler um, to figure out how, for example, um, class uh, hierarchies look like. But right now it's C. But only if for now, you can you, you analyze uh, assembly code listings. But okay. of course, you can even analyze Haskell. It just looks a bit crazy. Yeah. So we have two more questions planned. Raise your hand if you want to ask more. No, it's a simple question, but <clears throat> um, what's the logic behind the, the compiling? Uh, it's uh, besides of the scope of this uh, the talk, but uh, when you decompile a, a list of the assembly, you decompile in C or C like. Um, what's the logic behind you? Uh, you you pick an. Uh, uh, a code of chi uh, associated by a list of assembly uh, besides another. So what you can do is what, for example, Ida Pro mostly does is pattern matching. Um, you can, f of course, the compiler uh, turns certain constructs into certain assembly code listings, and you try to try to recognize that and turn it back. And um, other ways is to just turn the code into C. So you uh, turn it into some kind of um, well C expressions. And then um, you can turn the assembly code expressions into a C expression. Um, the de de decompilation is just three processes. You only have to recover um, the, the control flow um, architecture, the control flow constructions in C. So you can do this with pattern matching. You see, OK, when, uh, when I have a block that uh, just have a loop, OK, that's a, that's a loop. So you can turn it into a loop. Um, what's more complicated is to recover the type information and then to recover how the stack is used. Um, that can be done with assembly with, with the abstract interpretation and um, the type information where you can do a type inference algorithm you have with Haskell or with Rust. And um, to, for this to work, you also need type, typing information. So you um, need to encode into the disassembler that certain API calls have a certain typeset. And so you can use this when, when the assembly code calls this function, you know, okay, um, the arguments must, be, must have test types and you can try to push the information down into the assembly code. So that's pretty much how decompilation works. Okay, thank you. <laughs> More questions? Um, uh, one question. Uh, oh, actually, the, the, there are two. Uh, first question: What was the reason not to use any of the existing uh, disassembly libraries? Uh, which would give you uh, uh, access to more processor families. Uh, and the second yeah. question uh, would be: uh, Is uh, is there an option for, uh, for example, uh, uh, another type of syntax like ATT syntax? And I know you use Intel syntax for for the x86. Um, so currently, we only um, oh, let's start with the assembly question. Um, the problem is that the assembly libraries you have now don't don't give you really semantic information. Um, there is capstone, which can tell you at least which part with arguments are written and which are read, but it can tell you what's the function between those two arg um, arguments. And um, doing this is the most of the of most of the work. So um, 
I saw no much use in uh, trying to wrap library because trying to wrap C, wrap C libraries and having it um, compile flawlessly on most machines is very hard with Rust. Um, so when you only have Rust, it's easier. And um, okay, we, of course we can generate HTTP syntax. Uh, there's a we can put a switch in there. Um, currently we have Intel uh, hard coded, but that's not much of a problem. My time's up. Okay, okay. let's thank Kai. <laughs> oh. And there's a five minute break. Please open the door so we can get some air in. Thank you. I need to tell you one thing, both of you. So okay. you are responsible of these. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, I guess okay. so. Because I'm a journalist from Italy.